It's time for Security Now, and it is a Sharknado, this episode dedicated to a zero day revealed by security researchers in every single U-verse Eris modem, and it's a bad one. Lots to talk about. Also, uh, some interesting research which just came out by Brian Krebs on the Marcus Hutchins story. All is not as it appears, perhaps. We apologize in advance. You'll notice during the show, and I hope it's not too bad, uh, that there is there are audio breakups. We do know about it. Steve and I spent a long time trying to troubleshoot. I think we know what it is, but we weren't able to fix it for this episode. So my apologies for the occasional glitches and burps. Um, nothing we can do about it. We will not have this problem next week, though. I, pr I promise you. Stay tuned. Security Now is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 627, recorded Tuesday, September 5th, 2017. Shark NATO? Security Now is brought to you by IT Pro TV. A good IT Pro is always learning, and IT Pro TV is the resource to keep you and your IT team's skills up to date. Visit itpro.tv slash security now and use the code SN30 to get a free seven-day trial and 30% off a monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. And by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash security now. It's time for Security Now, the show where we protect your privacy and security online with this cat right here, this groovy individual named Stephen Tiberius Gibson, the man at GRC.com. With, with the extra ebullient Leo Laporte. Yes, I am. Uh, I must have had a little something-something. As our co-pilot, I think you did, Leo. Uh, so oh, I yeah, start... wait a minute, I did. What was that weird drug you sent me? <laughs> <laughs> that thing that's supposed to improve your alertness. What was that? The, yeah. That weird um, uh, vitamin, wasn't PABA, but it was like it. That oh, was, I forgot now. Yeah, remember that? You, oh, uh... Mm. You need some, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so funny because you said earlier that I was kind of peppy on Security Now. I mean, on the Mac Break Weekly. Oh my goodness! Obviously, I didn't so. notice it, but uh, it must be that thing. I only took three hundred twenty-five milligrams. It was lysergic acid it diethylamide twenty-five? <laughs> I think. No, that's no, not, not it. it. It's probably. Uh, you're on... right. I think I I did give you a norepinephrine precursor. Didn't uh, you I? did. Um, Yes. Completely um, legal in most states, I might add. <laughs> wow. I, you know, well, I, for, I forgot I'd taken it. <laughs> and uh, that explains the peppiness. Okay. Yes, back off from that, Leo. I think maybe, I took a little uh, dose, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I have to apologize. I think this is the first podcast we've, I've ever felt I had to apologize for the title. Um and although there are an unbelievable five Sharknado movies, this will be the first and last time we ever use that title for the podcast. Well, you better have a good reason for it. Uh, oh well, <laughs> uh, it is a. It was a whoever named this disclosure. Oh, uh, it's like you know. Um, honey monkeys or heart bleed. In this case, it's Sharknado. It's the name of the set of vulnerabilities that were found in AT&T U-verse modems. And they are, I mean, I was going to say heart stop, but that's a different story we have today. Um, they're, it's unbelievable. So I want the, the guys who wrote this up disclosed it immediately when they realized how bad this was just to, to deliberately put pressure on AT&T because it's unconscionable oh, what they have done. I know what you're talking about. This is a problem with the Eris modems. Yes. 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 It, it, it's the Eris modems and then AT&T OEMs them from Eris and then alters their own firmware. So there's some question as to 
is it looks like it may be both. But when our listeners, we're, I, I'm going to put it at the end of the show, we'll, we'll get to it. When they, <laughs> when our techie listeners understand how bad this is Ugh. in all in, in some cases, in every single one of the AT&T U-verse systems, for example, allows anyone on the Internet anywhere to access the ports on any of your machines behind the router. So essentially not requiring port mapping, oh. but just go, pen it going straight through. It's just incredible. So I thought, okay, we have to further shine light on this. And it just is another perfect example of, boy, you know, doing it wrong. So this is podcast 627. Um, we're going to talk about that. We've got another update, an interesting one, this time from Brian Krebs. Just went just went live an hour or two ago. And so, uh, but it's an interesting take. Brian spent the last three weeks researching Marcus's background and drew, coincidentally, but he did the work, we were just guessing, uh, the, exactly the same conclusion we had for the last few weeks about sort of the backstory here. We're going to discuss the validity of WikiLeaks documents, the feasibility of rigorously proving software correctness. Um, nearly half a million people are getting a part of their body's firmware updated. Uh, <laughs> you another said firmware. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> another <laughs> another <laughs> Calm down, Leo. I'm sorry. Uh, another. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever take any more of that than, than you did. It's DLPA. Yep, DLPA. Yep. <clears throat> yep, that's and, exactly uh, right. D I got I to gotta get uh, a new source for this stuff because it's awesome. DL, <laughs> DL -phenol phenylalanine yes. uh, is a two, two forms of an amino acid that oh. are the precursors. Completely yep. harmless. <laughs> been better than it's coffee. Actually very, it's, it, it's good for you. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> another controversial CIA project exposed exposed by WikiLeaks. A careful analysis of the FCC Title II net neutrality public comments comments. Uh, and it's really funny too because this was commissioned by the by the ISPs and they did not like the results. No. Uh, a neat two factor authentication tracking site. Um, as the stupid patent of the month, which is actually the EFF's title for this, not even ours being snarky. They were. Uh, and boy, you won't be, even believe what that patent office has done this time. An example of a, we were talking about vanity top level domains, like I could get .grc. And there is, uh, one just surfaced. I thought, oh, that's just a perfect coincidence. A tiny bit of errata um, and... Uh, a little bit of miscellany, and then we're going to discuss this utterly unconscionable security mistakes made by AT and T in their line of UVerse modems. So, and we, uh, I have an apology to make because I know our audio, if you're listening now and you hear it, is a little choppy, and we have we have we have no idea what's going on. We've been working on this, and we for we sent, forty minutes. Well, not just for forty minutes, for months, because we sent you a new audio interface, and we, right. We're trying to figure it out, but uh, we'll, we'll keep working on it. I apologize, uh, and we decided that the content is takes precedence over the quality in this case, and we wanted to get you that information. If you can't stand it, there will be handwritten transcriptions available at grc.com in a week or so, or a few days anyway. Uh, do you want to take a break? Yep. I know. you got to find some DLPA, man. This stuff is great. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because I did not I forgot I took it this morning and uh, until you said you seem unusually ebullient and have other people noticed it? no Has anyone have said? you noticed it? Is that before you go to bed? well I, I don't like to take it before you go to bed it gives you nice dreams elaborate dreams but uh, I like <laughs> the energy that it gives me am I supposed to take it before I go to bed or before a show? no before a show this that's is what I think <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to calm down now and talk a little bit about our sponsor, IT Pro TV. If you are in the uh, business of uh, protecting people's computers or fixing people's computers, if you run an IT shop, you know how important skills are. Having the right skill can make the difference between uh, you know doing the right thing and doing what AT&T did. If you want to get into the IT business, the way to prove your metal often is to get those certs. IT Pro TV is good for both. Keeping your skills up to date, and IT Pro is always learning, but also 
um, you know, getting those certs so you can get that first job. I want you to visit itpro.tv slash security now. Take a look at the offerings there. If you and your IT team are fighting off the latest cybersecurity threats, and I figure a lot of you listen to security now just for that reason, you've got to know about IT Pro TV. They're live every day, just like we are. In fact, the founders, Tim and Don, were uh, very complimentary. They said we were kind of inspired by tech TV in the old days and what you're doing with Twit these days. We thought this would be a great way to do IT training, something they've been doing for years. IT Pro TV's online IT training can help you prepare for what lies ahead, whether it's a great new job in IT or the cybersecurity threat of the day. Over 2,000 hours of on-demand training. They add, they have three studios now. They add more than 125 hours each week. Each week. They're kind of overachievers, okay? You guys, you should just calm down a little bit. You and your team can stream their courses, both live and on-demand. They have great uh, apps. Of course, you can use uh, their app to do it on Chromecast. They have a Roku app, a Fire TV app, Apple TV. There's a great IT Pro TV app there. You can stream it on your PC. They have iOS and Android apps, too. And so, in other words, you can get great training without leaving, without going off-site. Their courses are cover the range of everything from certified ethical hacker to how to use Kali Linux to learning Microsoft Server or ITIL. They've got ISC squared security certs and more. All you got to do is go to itpro.tv slash security. Now look at the calendar. You'll get some idea of the, some of the things coming up. They're really doing some stuff. Prepare for the certs too with the, well, CRISC. Is that how you pronounce it? C-R-I-S-C. C-I-S-S-P, CISM, C-I-S-M, C-I-S-A, Certified Ethical Hacker, C-E-H. Uh, get an individual membership or get a team membership if, you, if you've got a big team. The nice thing about the team solution, you get group pricing. You can get, uh, as the supervisor, get access to their portal, which keeps track of who's watching what, who's completed what. You get the training schedule. Uh, you can control that, custom groups, training assignments. Get analytics on, on both the group and individuals in the group. You can see their logins, their viewing time, their video downloads, track the completion, the course completion. So it's really a great training solution that you can do on site and have all of those, uh, you know, controls, all of that information. I don't know. I can go on and on. I love these guys, and I think they do a great product. I want you to go to itpro.tv slash security. Now, we've actually, that's where you could sign up for the team. And as an individual, we've got a great deal for a monthly membership. Use the offer code SN30, and you get 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. If you want to know about the team solution, if you're running an IT team or you want your, your boss to know about this, if you go there, you could sign up for a free demo and get the supervisor portal, get the whole thing. ITPro.tv slash security now. Seven days free and 30% off the individual membership with the offer code SN30. And I thank Tim and Don for doing a great product and for making us, letting us be a part of their uh, success. All right, Steve, on So my friend, I, fa I found the problem while you were, while you were telling us about IP, IT Pro TV. Yes. Uh, four hops away from me, on a Cox router is where everything is getting trashed. You can see it getting uh, stopped, huh? Yeah, I'm I using Ping Potter, Ping Plotter Pro, which is a tongue twister, uh, and it it goes out and it's, it's like a trace route, but it also does statistics and, oh, nice. and timing. And so there's a high pack loss. Everything is clean for the first four hops, and then it Whoa. hits a router where it just n nothing's coming back from it, and it's a huge amount of jitter, meaning that that it's just overloaded. That that router buffers are full, and so there's some, you know, someone else is like under a DDoS attack or something. So, oh, nice. Well, anyway, time to call Cox. The, <laughs> time to make a well, little phone call. Have you ever tried to call them? Yeah. If you get, no. you know, you get a guy who, you know, didn't quite make it out of high school, who's like just there on the front line. And we anyway. thought it was a good idea to give you, you know, you have a dedicated uh, cable modem, you know, but it is consumer grade and it worked fine at first, but you know. There's no yeah. SLA. There's no guarantees, right? It's best effort, as they say. Best effort. So check it. Like check out this picture of the week. It took me a while to figure out what it was I was seeing. This is the most embattled ATM I have ever seen. <laughs> oh, this is I this mean, in the Caribbean? Where is this? Uh, no, I can't. I you know the the the, the link did have the address, but it's um and I don't Maybe remember it's now. Venice where it was. Beach or somewhere. It's got a but. Oh my lord! First of it's all, got, it's got like boards a, all around it, and then there's graffiti. And, 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 
And that big red bar across is obviously to like keep something from backing into it or to keep you from ripping the ATM out and taking it away with you. I mean, it's it just, you know, I, I just like, first of all, one thought is why even bother having an ATM there? I mean, do you really have to have an ATM well, and there? Who would use it, right? Don't you? Exactly. It looks I mean, like you get a disease just walking <laughs> by. It's like the old phone booths. Oh. That's what phone booths ended up looking like. Oh. <laughs> Holy cow. Oh, yikes. Anyway, I just got a kick of it. It's like, here is technology trying to struggle against all odds. Wow. And, you know, at this point, skimming, you know, sticking your card and having a skimmer is the last of your worries. Yeah. If you're, I mean, I just, I wouldn't even get near that thing. It looks like it would bite you. <laughs> so, Brian Krebs, bless his heart, spent the last three weeks digging deep. And this is, you know, the moment I saw this, I thought, oh, this is perfect for Brian. This is what he does. You know, as we know, he he's interested in going back and really doing like the, the dark corners of the net, uh, taking the time to create us uh, I, identities that are not linked to him so that he can participate in the in the dark underbelly chat rooms and so forth and then he you know he brings his results to us so i was just as i said at the top of the show just made aware of his most recent posting uh which i've linked to here for anyone who wants to dig in but and i haven't had a chance i just i i just like i understood what it was he said so i've not been able to dig in i will go through it by before next week to see if there's anything more worth sharing but but to quote just the, the just the headline summary, here's what he said. He said, "At first, I uh, then I'm sorry, I forgot. We're talking about Marcus Hutchins, who, as we know, was arrested by uh, the law enforcement as he was trying to after DEFCON to go back to his home in the UK, and he was uh, detained. He's now uh, speaking of Venice Beach, Leo. He's now in Venice Beach with with two attorneys waiting for uh, trial. I think in, in next month in October." So Brian said, at first, I did not believe the charges against Hutchins would hold up under scrutiny. But as I began to dig deeper into the history tied to dozens of hacker forum pseudonyms, email addresses, and domains he apparently used over the last decade, a very different picture began to emerge. In this post, writes Brian, I will attempt to describe and illustrate more than three weeks worth of connecting the dots from what appear to be Hutchins' earliest hacker forum accounts to his real-life identity. The clues suggest that Hutchins began developing and selling malware in his mid-teens, only to later develop a change of heart and earnestly endeavored to leave that part of his life squarely mm, in the rearview mirror. That kind of makes sense. Yeah, It does. It makes total sense. So yay to Brian for doing that work. Thank you, Brian. And, um, of course, it exactly corresponds with our own what was just gut feeling. Like, well, you know, all the evidence was he wasn't happy that his recent work was being abused. Right. But there had to be something more. And I'm just hoping, I don't know what, who laws apply where if there are exceptions for underage that is non-adults but maybe that that will give him some shield if if he's if he's been you know kept his act clean and been a good guy as an adult maybe his you know earlier teen antics um are shielded by you know not having um you know not being at the age of consent and so forth so i don't know but anyway uh, I just wanted to provide, you know, Brian's really useful uh, research feedback. Again, thank you. Um, okay. Um, somebody following up on our comments last week about needing to remember, and, and you highlighted this for us, Leo, the, the we don't know if WikiLeaks document dumps which are so damaging to law enforcement you know actual technology use and reputation are real because we just don't know but someone sent me a link which initially looked like oh, there was a way to prove it it turns out that's email being proved not documents secreted somehow from the cia 
Um, so one of our listeners responded to my caution about placing possible unwarranted trust in WikiLeaks documents uh, with a link. Now, this is an older posting from about 10 months ago, October 2016, um, and by somebody with a lot of cred, uh, uh, Robert Graham, who's the guy at Errata Security. And of course, he's our old buddy from the Black, the Black Ice personal IDS firewall days in the early days of, of, of Windows firewalls. Theirs was a different kind of product that's called Black Ice that was more of an IDS. It was more of an intrusion detection system for a PC than, than just a simple firewall. Um, and so it wasn't rule-based, and it wasn't my my kind of solution. I just believe you should close ports down and open them wherever you wanted. Theirs was sort of more automatic, but a, a useful product. Anyway, WikiLeaks documents are not leaked emails. So Robert's blog posting is only relevant to email, but due to a technology originally developed as anti-spam as an anti-spam solution, um, as a direct consequence, incorporate cryptographic signatures that, as cryptographic signatures will, can be used to authenticate a document and prove with cryptographic certainty that it has not I been know, altered. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Nope. Um, so we we can validate WikiLeaks emails, well, or some WikiLeaks emails. Okay, so before I go any further, I want to remind everyone, because this is a political case, that you know this is not a political podcast, and I work scrupulously to keep us from falling into that controversy. Um, I don't know what Robert's politics are, even if he is political, but th this isn't about that though it touches on something from our last election cycle. Robert writes in, a, uh, in his posting last October, October 2016, he said, recently, WikiLeaks has released emails from Democrats. Many have repeatedly claimed that some of these emails are fake or have been modified, that there's no way to validate each and every one of them as being true. He writes, actually, there is, using a mechanism called DKIM. Um, that's Domain Keys Identified Mail. Um, DKIM is a system, he writes, designed to stop spam. It works by verifying the sender of the email. Moreover, as a side effect, it verifies that the email has not been altered. He goes on, Hillary's team uses HillaryClinton.com, which as which is DKIM enabled. Thus, he writes, we can verify whether some of these emails are authentic. Now, I, there's a caveat there that I'll get to in a second. He said, recently in response to a leaked email suggesting Donna Brazil gave Hillary team early access to debate questions, she defended herself by suggesting the email had been, quote, doctored, unquote, or falsified. And he writes, that's not true. We can use DKIM to verify it. Um, and then he provides a link to uh, the, sp sp the specific email and notes that it's not a smoking gun, but at the same time, it both claims they got questions in advance while having a question in advance. Um, and then he said, Trump gets hung on similar chains of evidence, so it's not something we can easily ignore. I don't understand what he meant by that, but regardless, he says, anyway, this post isn't, um, oh, and now it's my voice. Anyway, this post isn't about the controversy, thank you, Robert, but the fact that we can validate email. When an email server sends a message um, that is a DKIM-enabled email server, um, it'll include an invisible header. They they aren't tech, you know, headers. Email headers aren't specifically hidden. Uh, most email programs allow you to view them. It's just the way. It's just you know, there's a just a bunch of debris that confuses people, so we don't want to see them. So, um, uh, and then he goes on to explain that that so um, normally. This email validation is server to server. That is from SMTP server to SMTP. 
meaning that when a, a sender of email sends their email from their email, their, from their POP or IMAP client to an SMTP server, then it's got a private key. It, it makes a ha it takes a hash of the entire email, subject line, time and date, body of the email. It, so it hashes that, and then it digitally signs the hash to create a signature which cannot be forged. Then to its destination. The receiving SMTP server receives it, sees that it has a DKIM header, meaning that it, it is this particular piece of email is verifiable. It is validatable affirmatively. So if it doesn't already have the private key in its cache of of candidate recipients, and, and you know there are so many domains in the world, it probably doesn't. It does a DNS lookup, and this is one of the reasons I, you know, our listeners know that I'm so excited about the idea of DNS being this generically of a uh, useful database, an internet, uh, you know, an, an internet internet wide cacheable index, and thus. When DNSSEC finally happens, to be able to have that robustly secured is going to create an incredible asset for the world. So in this case, there's a text record, which is an additional record for a domain. So for example, HillaryClinton.com had a text record which allowed that domain to publish its public key. So it signs outgoing email with its private key which it keeps secret and in control, but then any recipient can go, oh, let's make sure this really did come from HillaryClinton.com and not a single character was altered. In that case, the recipient, the, the receiving SMTP server performs a, a special DNS query, not asking for an IP address, but asking for the text records, which are just textual that are associated with that domain name. That allows it to get a a a, um, a base 64 encoded version of the binary public key it de it decodes that into binary then it uses that public key to verify the signature so all of that happened it turns out there's an extension which you can get he uses thunderbird so he said how do you verify this is true there are a zillion ways with various dkim verifiers and he writes, I use the popular Thunderbird email reader from the Mozilla Firefox team. They have an add-on designed specifically to verify DKIM, meaning that in this case, the your email client itself does that same verification. It queries the DNS, the remote DNS, gets the public key, and shows you as you're looking at email whether it's verified or not. So it's kind of a cool add-on for an email reader. I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't get in your way at all. It just it will let you know if this is spam or not. If it's DKIM signed, the chances are way lower. At least it's not spoofed. Uh, you could have a DKIM, DKIM signed spam email, but it can't also be a spoof domain. So once you decide you don't want any more email from that server, you can put it on a blacklist and there's no way it, it could dump around. So anyway, he says, downloading the raw email from WikiLeaks and opening in Thunderbird with the add-on, I get the following verification that the email is valid. And he provides us with a screenshot. He said, specifically, it validates that the HillaryClinton.com sent precisely this content with this subject on that date. Um, so um, that's all true. Um, the problem is this evidence appears to be pretty damning, but this is, you know, we have here a security and technology podcast. So we always ask the question, how sure are we? Cryptographically, we're absolutely as positive as we could be that the signature is correct. However, as we've often discussed in the case of HTTPS connections with TLS certificates, and this is uh, this applies with DKIM, they the certificates that is the private keys, the and the security of the system absolutely relies on the assumption 
that the signing server is uncompromised because it's the it's that's what the, it's the signing server that has the private key that allows it to perform this authentication or to provide the authenticatable content. But the whole point of this in this in this case this Hillary email debacle was that their email server was compromised. And as we know, if in addition to the um, the 30,000 some emails that were reportedly obtained, if that private DKIM key was also obtained, then we're right back where we started with a somewhat harder to substantiate claim of document doctoring, but still, uh, you know, a, a way that it could have happened. So, um, you know, this stuff, we get down in the weeds with the technology, but we never really talked about DKIM in the entire 12 plus years of the podcast. So, um, and this doesn't, of course, speak to WikiLeaks documents and their forgeability or not, only to email and only to email that is DKIM signed and only in that case where there's reason you can reasonably assume that the DKIM signature could not have been spoofed. But unfortunately, in this case, where a server compromise was part of the story, you really can't make that assumption. So we have we did before in terms of you know secure crypto crypto level assurance which we would like to be able to have in this case but um unfortunately the facts really don't support that but still an, an interesting twist um we've talked some time ago about this questionable um deterministic random bit generator, which used the dual elliptic curve technology, which the NIST had standardized on uh, against all reason. Um, it was, there are four that they have in their kit. Um, and this is a, I don't have the, the doc. Oh yeah, it's, it's um, NIST document 800-90A. Um, hash-based version, an HMAC-based version, meaning that, that it's a keyed hash. There's a counter a counter running through a cipher-based version. And then, of course, the infamous dual elliptic curve, DRBG, which is based on the elliptic curve to cryptography. And remember that there was the problem with it that surfaced a couple of years ago was that there's no, you know, the, the NSA provided the curve parameters with no um, substantiation for where they came from. They just said, here are these magic numbers. Well, the problem is those magic numbers could have been hiding a back door, which could have allowed someone who had some of the random numbers that were being produced to get the other ones. And then to make matters worse, it was the slowest of the four. There's like four different algorithms all and the other three are obviously strong but for example rsa chose the slowest one that one and it was like so there was like again we don't have we had no proof of anything but it just seemed like a, a, a compounding of suspicious circumstances so all of this by way of the fact that matt green um and a team went to the trouble of absolutely verifying everything about one of these. They took the HMAC DRBG and have published a paper out of Princeton, verified correctness and security of embed TLS. That's M-B-E-D TLS, which is a, a, a an embedded uh, TLS crypto that happens to use this HMAC deterministic random bit generator to generate its pseudo random numbers. Um, okay, so I'm going to explain this a little bit, but I want to talk more. One of what I really wanted to do is to use this as a jumping off point to talk about software verification. Um, so they write, we have formalized the functional specification of HMAC DRBG, and we have proved its cryptographic security that its output is pseudo-random, which 
Sounds like not a big deal, but that's a high bar. When, and when these guys say prove, they're not saying we're of the opinion or five of us all looked at the code. They're saying, no, we have proved it. They said using a hybrid game-based proof. We have also proved that the embed TLS implementation written in C correctly implements this functional specification. And of course, that's exactly what we want. We want proof that the, both the theory and the practice, which is you know, to say in this case, the implementation are both verifiable, both solid. So they continue, that proof composes with an existing C compiler correctness proof to guarantee end to end that the compiler's output machine language program gives strong pseudo randomness. They write all proofs, hybrids, hybrid games, C program verification, compiler, and their composition are machine checked with the COQ proof assistant. So there's some, some automated assistance to help unwind any spaghetti in a code and, and absolutely nail down what's going on. They said our proofs are modular. The hybrid game proof holds on any implementation of HMAC DRBG that satisfies our functional specification. Therefore, our functional specification can serve as a high assurance reference. And so what I want to bring to this is that this, this is the future. We're not there yet, but computer programs are just math. You know, they're not a crapshoot. They are a, a, a deterministic processor, assuming there are no bugs in the processor. So we have had them in the past, so we have to make that caveat. But if the processor properly follows the instructions, each instruction, it does exactly what it's supposed to. And then there are other problems like, you know, cache conflicts or instructions interfering with each other. So it gets complicated quickly. But, you know... Computer programs are not flowers and trees and fields of stars. You know, they're absolutely and utterly subject to pure and perfect rigorous analysis and verification. The problem is it's difficult. It's unclear how fast we're going to see progress in this area, but this this is a larger chunk of verification than I remember seeing recently. So it feels like we're getting better at it. I don't know if it'll happen in our lifetimes. On the other hand, we're seeing exponential growth in AI capability. So that might be a factor. You know, ask Watson if the program is provably correct. So, and, and this is why for me as a, as a writer of code myself, I've always chafed at this at the lay statement, which unfortunately is true, that all software contains bugs, which we've all heard that said before. We may have said it ourselves. You know, um, I would back off from that though and say that trivial software can be easily bug-free. However, more complex software, for example, like the U.S. shuttles. You know, flight guidance and navigation computer, which needed to be bug free, can be bug free if it's sufficiently important to then pour incredibly extensive resources into it in order to make it so. So my point is that the nature of software to get rapidly, insanely complex is the nature of software to get rapidly, insanely complex as it grows in size. The, the interactions within a program just become crazy. Um, so very quickly, a trivial small program, you know, like a loop that adds numbers. Okay, I want to compute Fibonacci. Okay, that's three lines of code. It has no bugs. I mean, it's, it's so simple, it's clearly perfect. It's probably correct. But you start adding bells and whistles to it, and things go out of control quickly. And that's the point. This the complexity just exponentiates. It goes insane. And and so it, out, out of our ability to to perfectly know that that it was exactly correctly implemented. So 
Um, I think what's destined to happen, and again, I, I have no sense for timeline, but it, we need it to happen. We're getting the capability for it to happen. And so I think it will, is that what will happen over time as as the computing resources increase, and they're clearly going in that direction, is that the cost of rigorous software correctness, proofs, and verification will fall dramatically. So that so that we're not we're, we're no longer guessing that it's okay because it stopped not being okay, and so we go, whew, ship it. Instead, we tell Watson, okay, we're here, we're here we go. Does this do what we think it's going to do? And, and I mean, this is not a small problem to solve, which is why it has so far been virtually intractable and it is so insanely expensive because of the fact that we just don't know how to do it yet that none of our software, I mean, virtually none of it is has been proven to be correct. Uh, it, we kind of limp along and get updates and patches and say, well, okay, uh, because that's a lot cheaper. But imagine a day where we where we have AI that is able to to do what we cannot do, which is to find the bugs that that are there but haven't that are not manifest, and say, "Whoops, you uh, you meant to do this over here, didn't you?" Oh, yeah, thank you for, for telling me no. So, anyway, so Matt and, and his group did that. They wrestled a, a substantial piece of work to the ground producing mathematical certainty that it is correct, which is very cool. And I, I, you know, you and I, Leo, may never see that may, may not live to see the day, but, uh, you know, in the future, you can imagine that because it is just math, because these are deterministic systems, um, they could be given sufficient um, focus, uh, made perfect, which would be nice. Wow. Love that. And I'm going to take a sip of my tea. Tea away. <clears throat> I, I, you know, I, uh, I love this DKIM uh, conversation about auth authenticated email. And I think, I don't know if people are, are aware of this, and many email servers don't offer this as a choice and so forth uh, and so on. Um, we had a, a guy on the show, um, Dylan T Tweeney, who used to be a uh, fast company uh, reporter. He's now working for a company called Valimail, V A L I M A I L dot com. And they do somehow, I'm not sure how, they do validated email. But one of the things they will do is check your address and see if SPF and DKIM are properly configured. And uh, that will at least give you some idea of if your current mail server is doing uh, what it needs to do yep. to. Uh, to do that and uh, I think that's at least a first step and I think that they then do offer some more uh, help if you want to do more there's a third standard DMARC which is really hard to implement it, it, it sits on top of yes. DKIM and SPF but there's all sorts of issues it requires authenticated SMTP through that one email address and etc cetera, etc cetera. so um, my uh, email provider Fastmail does offer uh, uh, SPF and DKIM they don't do DMARC yet but that's a nice thing to have that way, if you get an email from me or Steve, I'm sure Steve does it right. Uh, you can authenticate that it really came from them, yep. uh, and it hasn't been. And more importantly, maybe hasn't been changed. Right. Uh, our show today brought to you by Rocket Mortgage. This is the future too. Rocket Mortgage is taking uh, the mortgage industry, which has never been known for. It's more known for like 18th century technology than it is for high tech computer technology. But now Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans, by the way, the best mortgage lender in the country, uh, takes it and makes it 21st century, putting it all online. You can literally get approved for a loan in minutes right from the website, rocketmortgage.com slash security now. You, could, it's, you can do it from your phone, from your tablet, from your computer. You could do it even if you don't have access to all your paperwork. You know, it's all up in the attic. You're on the road. Maybe you're at an open house. You see a house you want. You say, let's buy it. You don't have to go home. You don't have to go to the bank. You just have to go to rocketmortgage.com slash security now. Their trusted uh, relationships, it's quick and loans, that with all the financial institutions means they can identify you. You give them some information. They get uh, the, the credit records. And then they can also see, they see everything they need. And they can crunch it instantly.
based on income, assets, and credit, and and uh, analyze all the home options for which you qualify and tell you, here's your choices. You choose your term, you choose your rate, and it's all done online instantly. You literally get loan approval within minutes. And, I, you know, if you've never bought a house before, you may not know how amazing that is. But I can tell you the last time we, Lisa and I bought our house was about, we bought it about four years ago. It took months, months, not minutes. Rocket Mortgage is a revolution. And I want you, I mean, maybe you're not buying a house right now. Maybe you're not refinancing right now. But I want you to bookmark rocketmortgage.com slash security now. So when the time comes, you'll know exactly where to go. Apply simply at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Understand fully. They give you all the information. Understand, you know, what loans are available to you. And mortgage confidently. Rocket Mortgage, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. Make a note of it. Keep it in mind for when it's time. You'll be glad you have it. Rocketmortgage.com slash security now. The, yes, for those of you uh, watching at home, Steve has lost the caterpillar that used to haunt his face. <laughs> uh, we commented on it last week, but just in case people didn't, you know, tune in last week or didn't watch the video last week, he knows his mustache has gone missing. Yes, and it requires maintenance to keep it so. Yeah. So, hey, yes. I got a Dollar Shave Club for you. I'll send it out. Ah, I got it here perfect. somewhere. Yep. So the when I saw this title, I thought, wait a minute, how do you do that? The FDA is recalling 465,000 pacemakers. Uh oh. <laughs> but that's, <laughs> that's the not definition. Good. Of, that's an embedded computer. <laughs> yeah, literally in your <laughs> chest cavity. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so I this will this, this story will make your chest thump. Uh, that the United States FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, is recalling. 465,000 pacemakers to which attackers, get this, attackers can gain unauthorized access, wow. yes, to your pacemaker, wow. um, to issue commands, to change settings, and maliciously disrupt its function. Didn't we there talk about that hack some months ago? It feels like we talked uh, about it's that hack. Probably coming back around again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, because oh, in fact, this is not the first time that Abbott Labs has had a problem. Okay. You're right, exactly right, Leo. Okay. There was a related problem um, that they had f a few months ago. So good memory. Um, according to the FDA, the recall, the recalls are, are of affected pacemakers are tied to research by MedSec Holdings. I guess they were the researchers that originally bought or brought. The St. Jude medical equipment flaws to light about a year ago, and Abbott Labs acquired St. Jude Medical in January. Okay, so um, I snipped a bunch of nonsense out of the of the reporting because the details of the uh, exploits are chilling, uh, and, and I didn't really even realize we we've talked about U.S. CERT, the Cyber Emergency Response Team. Turns out there's an ICS CERT which is the industrial control system, cyber emergency. And apparently that's the category for pacemakers. You've got an industrial control system in your chest um, implanted or embedded. So the ICS cert manages um, industrial control system vulnerabilities, um, you know, catalogs them and, and tracks them and so forth. They cite three vulnerabilities in their advisory regarding the Abbott Laboratories pacemakers, uh, which were manufactured prior to August 2017, meaning last month. So unless your scar is really fresh, um, you, may, you may have one of these puppies. Um, the highest rated of the three vulnerabilities is... Pacemakers authentic get oh my it's hard even to say this the pacemakers authentication algorithm, the authentication key and timestamp can be compromised or bypassed. So there's an authentication bypass on your pacemaker, um, which could allow a nearby attacker because this is RF so it's radio so someone has to get an, an, you know in, in your proximity. Uh, to issue unauthorized commands to the pacemaker over the air, wirelessly. 
An additional bug could significantly reduce battery life of the pacemaker. You would, you know, you would like your implanted pacemaker's battery to get its the full benefit of its life, so that you're not having to be reopened again. Um, uh, the uh, the CERT advisory said the pacemakers do not restrict or limit the number of correctly formatted RF wake-up commands that can be received, which may allow a nearby attacker to repeatedly send commands to reduce the pacemaker's battery life. So in other words, the as, as we know, receiving radio is a low-power task compared to sending it. So... And, and this is a bi-directional interface between the outside world and the pacemaker in the person's chest. So the pacemaker is, is either always or periodically receiving, but that's that is very low power. It doesn't take much to receive. But in what but when it's explicitly awoken, then that fires up the transmitter and transmitting energy is far more power consuming than receiving it. So the second hack, uh, um, so is that a problem with the firmware that there is no limit on an attacker's ability to to drain the battery of your pace of a pay, an effective pacemaker by keeping its transmission radio running all the time. So, you know, you could imagine a t a t an attack scenario where an office worker who's generally going to be in a certain location is having his pacemaker drained without his knowledge, and certainly that's not what he wants. And then finally, third, the third flaw is related to the fact that the devices trans... Oh, again, <laughs> really? The devices transmit unencrypted patient information via RF communications to programmers and home monitoring units. So... They didn't bother to run a cipher on this. It's just plain text coming out, which is problematic. They write uh, that both the pacemakers that be oh, because the pacemakers store patient data in clear and transmit it in the clear. So that just feels like sloppiness. I mean, you could you could say, well, some things are a mistake, but as we've discussed often, it's important to separate policy from error, and it's hard to defend. You know, a person's pacemaker transmitting plain text to any receiver within range, which apparently these things have some range. If you've got a home monitoring unit, you maybe can walk around while it's while it's monitoring you. So, anyway, they have been recalled. Four hundred and sixty-five thousand pacemakers. Now, the good news is they are firmware upgradable by that same radio link. So we're not talking about any more open hearts or open cavity surgery. It's just, okay, fine. We'll, we, we need to see you in the doctor's office to update your body's firmware. Um, the vulnerabilities could be exploited, the advisory rights, via an adjacent network. Exploitability is dependent on an attacker being a target pacemaker to allow RF communications. And I'm not talking, I'm sure it's not Ethernet commercial Wi-Fi. It's, you know, it's going to be some wacky medical band RF. So it's not like your neighbor is going to receive it on their television set or something. It's, you know, it, it's definitely, you know, in its own world of RF spectrum. But if anybody were targeting someone, that would not represent any kind of a problem because we also have now very inexpensive SDRs, software-defined radios that you just can set to whatever you want. So um, anyway, mitigation of these problems require patients to visit their doctor for a short-range wireless update. Abbott it's warns cool that they can do that, though, I have to say. Yes, yeah. yes. And it's a, re yes. a relief, too. <laughs> and, and I'm sure that, you know, th this is all super regulated. So the devices are, you know, serialized. And there's a, I'm sure there's a, a database so that they're able to, you know, get notices to the, I was, I was going to say the end user, um, <laughs> um, but the, to, to their doctor and, you know, and follow up on this to to bring everybody back in and, and get it taken care of. But yes, Leo, I agree. The idea that you can, I'm sure they just, you know, put something on your chest and it has a dialogue back and forth. Abbott did warn 
that the firmware updates could should be approached with caution. That is, you know, they 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 really don't want anyone messing with an already in place pacemaker. They said, "quote Like any software update, okay. Well, we don't want to think that this is like any software update, but." That's what they said. Firmware updates can cause devices to malfunction. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> Gulp. <laughs> Gulp. <laughs> yeah. A botched update could result in a loss of settings to complete loss of device functionality. Mm -hmm. So you know, um, the good news is you will be in your doctor's office and uh, and not all pace not all pacemakers are like like replacing a, a bad uh, sinus node, which is stopped functioning. Some of them are just like demand pacers where right, right. If, 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 if you have a little bit of asystole, it notices and goes, whoops, and gives you a pacing spy. So so it, it's not like stopping would immediately kill you, but it'd be good that you've got your doctor standing by with some paddles. So interesting. Mm. Um Paddles. Okay. <laughs> I, hope not, I hope that's not required. Clear. <laughs> uh, we better book some surgery this minute. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So here we have a case, um, another WikiLeaks dump, where, boy, the press got this wrong. Um, the headline is CIA caught planting malicious software in Windows. Uh. Okay, but no, that's not what happened. And the code name, the, as all these things have fun code names, is Angel Fire. So the truth is that a team of hackers of the U.S. CIA, our Central Intelligence Agency, allegedly used, again, from WikiLeaks, so, you know, maybe, uh, used a Windows hacking tool against its targets to gain persistent remote access. Um, so, so what's as the part surprise of, here? I mean, of course they did. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What would you What would you have them do? And I'm glad they can do that. Yes, I'm glad we have break into the house. To, yeah. <laughs> Put a glass against so, the wall. Yeah. So as part of Vault Seven leaks, WikiLeaks last Thursday revealed details of a new implant developed by the CIA named Angel Fire to target computers running Windows. The Angel Fire framework implants a persistent backdoor on the target Windows computers by modifying the boot sector. In other words, it's a high-end, well-designed rootkit, mm. specifically for intelligence and law enforcement data gathering. It's got five components. I mean, it's a beautiful piece of work. Angel Fire is the umbrella. There is something called Solar Time, which is the thing that modifies the partition boot sector to load and execute the Wolf Creek, which is the the kernel code every time it boot up. So that makes it persistent over the long term. Wolf Creek, in turn, is a self-loading driver that runs in the kernel, which loads other drivers and user mode apps. Keystone is a component that utilizes DLL injection technology to execute the malicious user applications. And again, malicious should be in quotes because it's it's intended for this purpose. You know, they execute the purpose-specific applications directly into the system memory without needing to drop them into the file system. So there's no sign of them. There's something called bad MFS, which is a covert file system which attempts to install itself in non-partition space mm. available on the target computer and stores all drivers and implants. And we've seen rootkits do this. I remember talking a long time ago that as a consequence of the weird history of hard drives, there is this cylinder alignment. Cylinders don't exist anymore, like logically, the way we see them. We used to have cylinders, heads, and sectors. And partitions partitions used to have to end. They didn't have to start on a cylinder boundary, but they had to end on one, meaning that if the – so and a cylinder, especially when you have lots of heads or virtual heads and sectors, a, a single cylinder could be – and I used to know this by heart, but it's number of heads times number of sectors times 512 – 
that many bytes, a big chunk of space. So the idea would be a hard drive itself, which is now actually just a linear array of bytes. Um, it's not going to be an even multiple of the OS's arbitrary cylinder size. So there will be slack at the end. And in fact, in in 6.0 of Spinrite, I, uh, I understand that. And I specifically test all of the slack space and the inter-cylinder space uh, by rounding up and down appropriately and then and then clipping to size so that Spinrite doesn't miss anything. But the OS does. And so these guys using something that will be completely invisible. It's on the drive, but you can't see it. You can't get to it. And then the last, fit, that, that, those are the first four. The last piece is the Windows transitory file system, which is a new method of installing F Angel Fire. That is a method these guys came up with, which allows the CIA operator to create transient files for specific tasks, like adding, removing, uh, files to and from the Angel Fire system. So, and there's a user manual for it that WikiLeaks downloaded. The 32 bit, the 32 bit version of the import works against Windows XP and Windows 7, while the 64 bit implant can run on server 2008 R2 and Windows 7. So, um, it's, as so many of these things are, it feels a little bit dated. Okay, so like 7, but not 8.1 and 10. So, but, you know, very likely that they adapted, you know, Angel Fire 2 or 3 or something uh, if they want to, if they want to be use this. But once again, we've seen overblown and clickbait coverage of this in the press. For example, I read one report which opened with, quote, get this. I just, I mean, when I, I was worried when I read this because this was the first thing I encountered. I thought, what? Okay. It says, all Windows machines have been infiltrated by the CIA <laughs> under a project well, thank code goodness. name. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe under they mean all Windows versions or I don't know. That's weird. They, but I mean, yeah, but the headline actually take all Windows machines have been infiltrated. It's like, no, they haven't. So, and then it says, allowing the U.S. government to load malicious programs onto a person's computer without their knowledge. Yes, foreign adversary computer. I mean, you know, no one suggests that this should ever be perpetrated against U.S. citizens in contravention of U.S. law and the U.S. Constitution. And, uh, and you know, uh, no one's suggesting that they ever did. That this is very likely part of their toolkit for remote intelligence gathering. I mean, and, and we don't have any evidence one way or the other. But, you know, that's the assumption. And so I'm glad they've got you know, power tools, you know, as long as they point them somewhere else. And, I, you know, I presume they do. Okay, so in a little bit of a turnabout is fair play, um, the a consortium of ISPs commissioned an independent third party because they wanted, you know, no, they wanted a clean hands to analyze all of the submissions which were made on the topic of net neutrality and the, you know, Agit Pies threatened or planned anti-Tidal II plan. Um, Ars Technica had some nice reporting about this. Uh, and this falling under the category, of, be careful what you ask for. Um, Ars wrote that a study funded by internet service providers has found something that internet service providers really don't like. The, over, the overwhelming majority of people who wrote unique comments to the Federal Communication Commission want the FCC to keep its current net neutrality rules and classification of ISPs as common carriers under Title II of the U.S. Communications Act, according to the study which was just released. I've got a link to the study for anyone who's interested in the show notes. And get this, 98.5% of the unique net neutrality comments said, don't change anything. The study was conducted by a consulting firm, M M Prata, E-M-P-R-A-T-A, -A, and was funded 
by the so-called Broadband of America Coalition, whose members include AT&T, CenturyLink Charter, uh, CTIA, the Wireless Association, Comcast, and CTA, Internet uh, Television Association, and the Telecommunications Industry Association. Oh, and U.S. Telecom. So, you know, a lot of big players. When Emprata analyzed all 21.8 million comments, including spam and form letters, 60%, because if you just looked at them all without discrimination, 60% were against FCC Chairman Ajit Pai's plan to repeal the Title II classification, and 39% supported the repeal. But the numbers shifted starkly, ours writes, in favor of keeping the Title II rules when excluding duplicates in order to analyze just unique comments written by real people. In Pratt wrote, there are considerably more personalized comments appearing only once in the docket against, against repeal, meaning in favor of leaving everything alone, that is 1.52 million were leave it alone versus only 23,000 personalized individual, probably real comments supporting repeal. Presumably, they write, or Emprata says, these comments originated from individuals that took the time to type a personalized comment. Although these comments represent less than 10% of the total, this is a notable difference. Meaning, if you look at them all, it's a 60-40. If you look at ones that are probably authentic, mm. it's a 98.5. Yeah. I, wrote a, <laughs> I wrote a personal long comment, as long yes. as I could fit in there, uh, saying why net neutrality needs to be preserved for my personal business. Yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if it'll make a difference. Um, I just wanted to report on this interesting stat because we've talked several times now about this flood of spam that I mean that and DDoS attacks that basically just knocked it off. It just I mean like you know they had, they had to take it down off the net for a while in order to in order to let things cool off and they put it back on again. So again, I don't. Unfortunately, we're in a world where, as we know, the big the guys with the big bucks can pay the big lobbying firms to apply strong pressure on the on our politicians to to do what they want to have done. So well, we'll keep our fingers crossed. I've, Leo, you're going to love this one. A fabulous site, twofactorauth.org, T-W-O, F-A-C-T-O-R-A-U-T-H dot org. Uh, I recommend it without hesitation to our listeners. Twofactorauth.org, the URLs in the show notes. It is it is a comprehensive listing. Now, Leo, click one of those icons. What happens is it opens the row below and gives you a breakdown of, by the type of authentication offered by a huge range of of services and sites within the category that the icon uses. So, you know, there's communications, there's cloud providers, there, there's all kinds of different categories, but it shows you, for example, that that row is, uh, the row on the far right is what we want. That's the the software time-based solution that the uh, row- okay, So that's Google. Authenticator or something like it. There's Google exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. The one in the middle is what, what we're now sketchy about, and that's the SMS authentication right. where they're sending it in real time. But this is just a cool reference for, like, I could imagine somebody really security conscious when shopping for a service, a, a bank or a cloud provider or whatever, might say, well, I want one with time-based uh, token two-factor authentication. This lets you shop the industry for for that and you'll, you'll see the links there they also provide you in instances where there are where a provider or a service has none you got links to make it easy to tweet your request that they add it to help apply pressure for for second factor authentication where it doesn't exist so two factor auth spelled out dot org 
Um, and just to take, I, I commend it to our listeners. Just take a time and scroll around. It's well organized, uh, and it, it, it's got GitHub behind it, and it, sub, it accepts user submissions of things they don't have yet, uh, and it's constantly being maintained. So well, it's, it's, a really, it's a GitHub repo, so that's an interesting way uh, of keeping it up to date. So if, right. if you can submit, uh, which which means that people are continually keeping it up to date. I was curious how old it is. Uh, last commit was a day ago, so. People are, and the last commit was Stripe added UTF support. So you can add a commit if you know enough to how to use GitHub when when something changes to do it, which nice. is great, which is really great, yeah. And in fact, you could install your own local copy of it if you wanted. If you wanted. <laughs> I'm not sure where you'd want to, but because it's GitHub, you could uh, you could do that. You could, nice. You could run it locally. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, maybe for okay, you're right. You you wouldn't. I guess you would. You typically wouldn't want this offline because you're inherently an, right. an online process. Right. But, but yeah, to make a to make a snapshot, so, that'd be cool. I'm seeing more and more of uh, this kind of collaborative stuff. Instead of using a wiki or some other solution, using GitHub and 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 Git's commands to uh, to keep it up to date. So that's kind of a cool way to do it. That's a cool app, uh, an application. Yeah. yeah. So the EFF labeled this in their posting and it's in their url the stupid patent of the month oh boy and leo jp morgan got a patent i'm not kidding you is everyone just make sure you're centered on inter-app permissions oh. <laughs> glad they invented that finally oh god God, somebody had to, Leo. It was just staring us in the face. Why <laughs> did anyone think of that before? A system and method for communication among mobile applications. Groundbreaking. 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 It's shocking. Um, the, so the EFF writes, we have often criticized the patent office for issuing broad software patents to cover obvious processes. Instead of promoting innovation in software, the patent system places, they write, landmines for developers who wish to use basic and fundamental, and by the way, old tools. Well, as I remember, this, this is how a modem handshake works. <laughs> <laughs> They've patented it. So, uh, the, the, yes, the sound of geese mating. <laughs> um, this month's stupid patent, they write, which covers user permissions for mobile applications, is a classic example. On August 29th, so last Thursday, the U.S. Patent Office issued patent 9747468, which then now refers to the 468 patent, to J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, the geniuses there. Who and uh, who came up with this patent titled "System and Method for Communication Among Mobile Applications"? It's it's a breakthrough, Leo. Who ever heard of mobile applications communicating with each other? The patent covers a simple idea. They write of a user giving a mobile application permission to communicate with another application. <gasps> this idea was obvious, they write, when J.P. Morgan applied for the patent in June of 2013. So only four years ago. What was the, How old is the iPhone? It had the little thing that popped up yeah. and said, you know, do you want this app to have access to your photos? Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Even worse, they write, it had already been implemented by numerous mobile applications. The pat And built into iOS, the patent office... I'm, I'm surprised that Apple didn't get a patent on it, but anyway, the, they probably knew they didn't invent it either. Patent office handed out a broad software monopoly while ignoring both common sense and the real world. So they, they, they provide in this the full, the full text. Of, <laughs> yep. Yep, yep. They provide the full text of claim one of the 486 patent. There's just five clauses, so I'll read them. A method for a first, and this is like legal speak patent talk, a method for a first mobile application and a second mobile application on a mobile device to share information, comprising the first mobile application executed by a computer processor on a mobile device determining 
that the second mobile application is present on the mobile device, receiving from a user permission for the first mobile application to access data from the second mobile application. The first mobile application executed by the computer processor requesting data from the second mobile application. And finally, the first mobile application receiving the requested data from the second mobile application. Like, again, Leo, shockingly brilliant. <laughs> like, wow. How did they think of that? That's it. The claim they write simply covers having an app check to see if another app is on the phone, getting the user's permission to access data from the second app, then accessing the data. Anyway, and, and see, for those who ha we talked about patent trolls and, and the, the East Texas nightmare and, and all that, Samsung putting their logos and supporting the local sports team, trying to beg for, you know, trying to say we're not evil to this wacky judge that just immediately, you know, who knows how, what kind of house he's living in and where the money is coming from. But um, it just seems all so slimy. The problem is... What J.P. Morgan now has is a license to sue, and 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 you you face this with a podcast patent, Leo. Yeah, you know, just it's like so suddenly, a someone can strong arm small players who who face the expense of defending themselves of about on over, over patent or against pat, a specious claim in patent court, in patent litigation, and in our the way our system works, because J.P. Morgan Chase, in this instance, has the patent, you can't call this um, a, a malicious prosecution. So you, you're not able to sue for damages. They have a right to sue somebody who's infringing the patent they received le you know, legitimately from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So... So it's it's just it's a disaster when when this happens, and so the problem is this will end up being overturned, but a huge amount of cash is going to flow back and forth within the system to attorneys and patent attorneys and and courts and and dockets and everything in order for a secondary process to kill something at great expense and time and emotional anguish of, of, on the part of the people who are targets of the patent holder only to undo what should have never been done in the first place. So, and I know that it's a, it's a, a rough job, but unfortunately patents are now being abused like this. And, and what happens of course is that so, so many large companies have portfo patent portfolios, as they call them. And we've seen the Apple thing. I mean, you know, Apple's patenting the sunrise in order to, to, in order to have it so that, so that then they can have a cross-license agreement with IBM and Microsoft and Google so that they all basically agree to be able to not sue each other over their respect, the contents of their respect to patent portfolios. But again, the, the system is just broken uh, in a way that is just, it's so, it's so demoralizing and, and, and sad. Okay, and finally, before we take our last break, uh, we talked, <laughs> you, you and I were talking and you surprised me last week by saying that, oh yeah, Anybody can get top-level domain, a, fa a vanity top-level domain. You know, I could get if you got the money. Yeah, if you got the money. Oh, and I, the thing that occurred to me after we talked about it, Leo, is I'll bet it's not just a one-time fee. Yeah, I'm sure you're you're paying every year for this thing Possibly, in order yeah. to yeah. in order to maintain it. And actually, suggesting that is the fact that believe it or not, the dot Mont Blanc domain. Wow, Mont Blanc had their own TLD, um, and and the IANA had a. Uh, I have a link to it in the page. Essentially, somebody commenting on it said, "We rarely see entire top level domains killed because, of course, typically you've got so many second level uh, machines in there. Like you know, .dot com is never going to go away. It would kill the world. So, 
Um, so Mont Blanc, someone thought, oh, that'll be fun. Let's grab, <laughs> let's grab our own top level domain. It was removed last Friday. Um, so not only did they apparently no longer want it, but you know they must have no longer decided it was worth the money that they were having to pay in order to hold it. So I, I just this was just a coincidence that this came along. I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, I wonder if it's the uh, Mont Blanc Pen Company. Must I, be. Huh? That's immediately where my mind went. Yeah, unless it's Switzerland. So you can't go there now. Cause it, <laughs> yes. <Maybe laughs> Switzerland registered it. Wow. Last break. Nope. There's no oh. no more ads. Oh. <laughs> we oh. run out of ads. I, I forgot. We, we, we you and I were so we didn't talk about with, it. With, yeah. With no. the quality of the of the connection. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And I know. I'm sorry to disappoint everybody, but uh, there's no <laughs> there's no ad. Sorry. You can't get up and pee yet. You got to keep listening. <sighs> Damn it. Uh, okay. So, uh, I can't even tell you. Every week there's a most tweeted thing. This time, it was me screwing up the Wrath of Khan story, of all things. I had said that when, when Khan was approaching uh, and Kirk, you know, a, 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 with no contact and radio silence, and Kirk was sitting there with his, with his hand on his chin thinking, huh, this is mighty peculiar. Um, I had said that Spock had told Kirk. Well, the first time I saw a, a comment, I was like, oh, of course I knew that. But, you know, I'm one of those. It was Kirstie Alley playing Savick, Lieutenant Savick. And she, being junior and very Vulcan, um, she, of course, was going by the book. So the fact that Kirk had not raised shields, she was telling him. And then and then Spock, who's, you know, been around the block a few times and on, on, on many adventures, he sort of back Lieutenant Savick down saying the captain is well aware of the regulations. So, of course, after getting blasted by Khan, uh, Kirk said, you go, you go right on uh, quoting regulations to me. So anyway, thank you, everybody, for the correction. It was uh, it was the how could you forget far. Kirstie Alley? My God, <laughs> she was a hot little uh, Vulcan, too. That was um, oh, anyway. So thank you. And then I love the second part. Someone else noted that there was another connection between that episode and this podcast, which was that at one point, and I haven't, it's been so many years since I've seen it. I don't remember the sequence now, but all, all um, Federation starships have an override code and Every starship knows every other starship's override code. Um, in other words, the ship that Khan was on was using the default password, which was never changed. And as a consequence, the Enterprise was able to log in to Khan's ship and bring his shields down and then return in favor of blasting him to into space i guess he was already there so i'm not where he got blasted to but anyway so i like i got a kick out of like yes Khan, well and in all in all in fairness to khan he wasn't an a, a an enterprise uh officer i mean a, a, a federation officer he was you know he'd been on some dirt ball for a long time and was pretty upset about that so uh, he didn't know how he wasn't sure how his ship worked and by the way uh, we have verified with the ICANN wiki that M dot mont blanc did belong to the pen company. Ah. I guess yeah, that's got to be the definition of a vanity domain. A, it's also <laughs> a long vanity domain. Seven letters. Yeah. Is significant. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's I have funny. news, Leo. Yeah. The, the, the guy who did the really nice artwork for us where Riker and uh, uh, Jean-Luc's faces were removed and ours were put in their place. Oh, yeah. He has requested a... A photo of me with mo no mustache, so that he can update. <laughs> oh, he did, very important. <laughs> so that it's not looking too dated. So, thank you very much. Very important. Um, okay, um, I got a nice note from Steve Holden uh, about Spinrite. Uh, apparently, a Eurythmics fan, and he said, "I wanted to let you know that Spinrite was able to help me recover some." 11 year old that's 2006 podcasts from the eurythmics and then he gives me a a, a url to them so steve thank you for sharing that i and i think that's cool um 
And I have a couple of closing the loop pieces. Um, yeah, the, exactly. Yeah. There's the link. They only yeah. had uh, four episodes. Ah, so well, they're probably not very probably not very long either. Yeah, I don't no, know like seventeen talking. minutes, twenty six minutes, thirteen yeah. minutes, and nineteen minutes. That's not even half of one security. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, uh, I got one tweet saying that I assume you would recommend LastPass authentication over others, meaning the LastPass app. And I just wanted to note to Mark and everybody else, no. Um, the fact that I'm a fan of LastPass as a password manager does not mean, and in, in, by default, and in this case is not the case, that I like their authenticator. You like Authy. I'm using... Google's auth, although I've downloaded but haven't yet found time or the need to configure another one that I talked about last week was probably what prompted Mark's qu question. But no, LastPass, the problem I had was that there wasn't enough on the screen. That is, I like to have a bunch of websites on the screen you know, without having to scroll a long way. And LastPass's UI was just taking up way too much space. So I thought, okay, I, you know, and they're all the same. As long as they're written well, and they're yeah. being maintained. It just doesn't I'm, matter. What my do. concern was, and I don't know if the LastPass authenticator does this, but if it syncs the authentication information back to LastPass, that would obviate the whole point I have two-factor, or one of the points of having two-factor, which is if somebody got my LastPass, it's a single point of failure now. If somebody got my right. LastPass bundle, they would, you know, they would still need the authenticator. Now, I don't know if, I didn't check, but I just thought, you know, let's get some heterogeneity in the... Uh, in the security here and not use yep. You're, uh, that's two products very, from the same yep, company. That, that, that's yeah. an important word, yeah. yes. Um, oh, and I was also talking about uh, X on, X off. We, and I was referring to it as, you know, like teletypes where you would see, where it was being used. It was an X off was sent by the computer to stop the, the paper tape reader so the computer could catch up and then start up again. And uh, Simon Pickup said regarding SN262, uh, uh, 626. He said, X on slash X off, live on. He says, I use it every day, pressing control S to pause scrolling um, on the titty output, you know, TTY, teletype output of an X term. He says, surely you do too. And I'm thinking, um, no, I'm trying to think if there's any terminal I have that runs so slowly now that that actually is useful. I mean, you know, we use like the, a more pipe or something in order to- I think it's the other way around. That it runs so fast you can't keep up. So you're- That's my point. You're pausing. Is it like, by the time you enter the command, if you're at the bottom, you're at the <laughs> end of the output. And it's like, okay, uh, fine. So anyway- they I, still, did so, Some keyboards though, I think still do have, maybe it's the, the scroll lock well, or something. It, no, no, it's just Control S to Control Q. Oh, Control S to Control Q. Yeah, I used that for yeah. years. I remember that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And so it it me and they work today, but nothing is so to, so slow that you have any time to move your hand over to the keyboard or like you know get the control <laughs> key down. The time it's yeah. done. Yeah, you so, got to use more or less or something like that. Okay, yeah. and Leo, you'll get a kick out of this. I cannot tell you how many people fewer than corrected me about Lieutenant Savick. Um, Said, what the hell is getting your car smogged? So well, people don't know what a, that is. We have an international audience, and I saw that over and over and oh, over in the last week. Yeah. So I did. Yes. So for those of you who don't have, who aren't in the U.S., here we with with, with CO two and other nasty chemical emissions from the tailpipe of our cars, in order to renew the reg the annual registration we it's necessary to to prove that your car still meets the 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 regulations and the guidance for emissions of smog thus getting your car smog as as it's called in slang um for the year model so you know i bought a i, I bought a jeep back in 84 uh, in the early days of spin run, which believe it or not is still on the road it's a six cylinder inline and it refused to die so i sold it to my best friend for a buck i said here you go that, that is your spare car i'm not going to sit around and wait for this thing to die um but the point is that you know it's not clean but it's old 
So it only has to be it only has to be held to the the emissions requirements at the time. So it's all kind of grandfathered. Well, and that's fair. But anyway, for I mean, all a, a huge number of people said heard me and said, "Getting your car smogged." And when you think about it, that would make no sense at all yeah, well, unless yeah. you. It's e test in Canada. They call it e test apparently. Ah. And I would imagine that there are something along those lines. Equivalent. An emissions yeah. test in other countries as well. Maybe not in China. No. I don't think China no. has. <laughs> Can you see the smoke? Okay. Well, maybe you should get that fixed. <laughs> yeah. When you we when have to wear a mask to go to walk around <laughs> outside. It's, yeah. Then in that case, you're the one who's getting smogged. And there okay. are there are states that apparently don't do this. Somebody in the chat room saying Wisconsin doesn't do it. Really? Yeah. Here in California. Oh, that's I right. Think it's, a Cal it's a California it thing. It may be a California. Uh, I think some states probably also do it. It may be a California. Yeah, Minnesota, Michigan, no. Emissions check in UK. Florida has no emissions Texas. test. I Is bet Texas, Texas does do not. No. Nope. Oh, that's why I was my I'm guess. Guessing. That's why it came to I'm mind. I'm guessing. Yeah. Anything goes there. By the way, you have a right to carry a sword now in Texas, so that's good. Well, you know, there might be snakes. In, in, <laughs> you never in know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, so in, in what is probably the most awkward of like, okay, how can we justify this? I mean, heart bleed, that, that was not a big stretch. That kind of worked. Um, MS Blast, that was that named itself. Um, this one uses the AT&T at the end of Shark N. And then add an O. So, so it's shark, nate, and and to to toe. So, okay, we knew they were going shark, nato. Fine. They did win the podcast, the, the once and only time those will ever be called the shark, nato podcast. Have you seen any of those previews, Leo? I have They're never, I'm proud to say, seen one shark, nato movie. Oh, I couldn't watch the movie, but even the previews, even the commercials but they're are They're intentionally just, bad, right? I mean, they're not, they're not yes, trying it's like to a, be good. It's like Leslie Nielsen and Airplane. I right. mean, it's, you know, I mean, you've got sharks flying through the air, biting people. And it's like, okay, <laughs> fine. So, but regardless of that, unfortunately, a ridiculous name was given to a serious problem. And so to offset the ridiculousness of the name... We had the serious problem. Um, when I encountered this in doing the research for today's podcast and the near criminal negligence this demonstrates or should be regarded as on the part of AT&T, I was stunned. And it immediately became our focus for this week and unfortunately the title. Um, not only as yet another useful walkthrough showing just how much can go wrong – but also to advise this podcast listeners themselves who may be AT&T U-verse subscribers might therefore be directly affected and to continue and to support the explicit intention of this publication who did the research to further highlight AT&T's negligence and the extreme danger that negligence has placed their paying and trusting customers in. So, yes, Sharknado indeed. The paper is so well written. I, I corrected a few typos here and there that I found, but as I was reading it, I was thinking, wow, this, this is written in a very well, this is, a, this is a, an English-speaking voice. And as we know, we've covered some in the past that weren't. So I'm just going to share this. I did cut out some and, and add it down for length, but it beautifully put together. They write, when, and, of course, I got the link in the show notes. When evidence of the problem described in this report were first noticed, it almost seemed hard to believe. However, for those familiar with the, or I'm sorry, technical history of Eris, and that's what you uh, cue in on, Leo, and their careless lingering of hard-coded accounts on their products, this report will sadly come as no surprise. For everyone else, <laughs> prepare to be horrified, <laughs> they wrote. In all fairness, it is uncertain whether these gapping, gaping, sorry, gaping security holes were introduced by Eris, the man, or if these problems were added after delivery to the ISP, 
in this case, AT&T Uverse. From examining the firmware, it seems apparent that AT&T engineers have the authority and ability to add and customize code running on these devices, which they then provide to the consumer as they should. Some of the problems discussed here affect most in fact, there's some. Well, there's one that affects all, but affect most AT&T U-verse modems, regardless of the OEM. While others seem to be OEM specific, so it's not easy to tell who is responsible for this situation. It could be either, or more likely, it could be both. The hope behind writing this is that the problems will be swiftly patched, and that going forward, peer reviews and or vulnerability testing on new releases of production firmware will be implemented prior to pushing it to the gateways. Again, so that's a summary of basically let's and, and clean up their act and do this right from now on. So we can hope. Security through obscurity is not acceptable, they write, in today's high threat landscape. And this is especially true regarding devices which A, route traffic, sensitive communications, and, and trade secrets for millions of customers in the U.S. B, are directly reachable from the Internet at large, and C, have wireless capability and therefore have an additional method of spreading infection and releasing data. Regardless of why, they write, when or even who introduced these vulnerabilities, it is the responsibility of the ISP to ensure that their network and equipment are providing a safe environment for their end users, meaning, yes, the responsibility unquestionably is AT&T's. This, sadly, is not currently the case. The first vulnerability found was, caught, was caused by pure carelessness, if not intentional altogether. Furthermore, it is hard to believe that no one is already exploiting this vulnerability at the detriment of innocence. I mean, they're that bad and they are – Shodan is like already knows them all. So this is horrific, um, which is why they write this report is not – passing go not collecting $200 and is going straight to the public domain the vulnerabilities found here will be or will be ordered roughly from least to most prevalent there's four of them okay so we got a little bit of trouble with attribution we're not sure if it's Eris or AT&T but regardless of whether you know of 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 where the problems were injected, where this happened, um, they wind up being in the victim's home. Okay, the first one. So we're going from least to most, <laughs> believe it or not. SSH is exposed to the internet with the super user account hard-coded um, with a password and uh, with a username and password. They write, it was found that the latest firmware update, not old ones, the like the one now, uh, for two of these motives, the NVG587 and the NVG599, I'm sorry, five, five, NVG589 and 599 modems, enable SSH, which of course we know is the, the secure shell service and server, meaning that an SH, SHH client anywhere can connect to your, your, your U-verse modem. Enable the SSH server and, and contains hard-coded credentials. Okay, get this. And they're here, right here. Remote SSH is the password. <laughs> and, I'm sorry. Remote SSH is the username. The password is 5 sap 9i26. There you have it. Anybody want to log in to someone's UVerse modem? Find the, you know, scan the net for SSH services and try using remote SSH as the username and 5SAP9I26 as the password. And maybe you'll get in. So they write, uh, 
using those credentials, which can be gain, used to gain access to the modem's C-shell client over SSH. The C-shell oh, is a nice. limited... Why do use C-shell? That, conveniently. I that to bash. It's, you, you don't want to have to grab the text and, and the reference, you know, to figure out, like, see, how, 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 how do I blank the line? Yes. Yes. Wow. C-shell, they write, is a limited menu-driven shell which is capable of viewing slash changing the Wi-Fi SSID and password, modifying the network setup, reflashing the firmware from a file served by an FTP server anywhere on the Internet, and even controlling what appears to be a kernel module whose sole purpose appears to be the injection of advertisements into the user's unencrypted web traffic. So if you do go to a website that does not over HTTPS, as we know, you have not established a secure tunnel that, that transits through the router. So if this module were in use, it would be able to install versus own ad banners into pages as they were returned from the remote server. Although they write, no clear evidence was found suggesting that this module is actually being used currently. It is present and vulnerable. Aside from the most dangerous items listed above, <laughs> the C-Shell application is also capable of many other privileged actions. To reiterate, the carelessness of this firmware's release. Remember, the most recent firmware. The C shell binary is running as root. And so any exploitable command, injection vulnerability, or buffer overflow will result, will, will result in a root shell. He says, yes, it is running as root and trivially susceptible to command injection through the use of the menu of the menu's ping functionality and due to not sanitizing parameters one can execute arbitrary commands through the menu that is you you use the semicolon to append two commands the ping accepts you know ping and then the ip address you want to ping then you put a semicolon and like echo backslash bin or uh, so forward slash bin forward slash net sh and and pipe that to slash etc slash shells and so you're executing unix commands as root by by adding whatever you want to on the end of the ping command where it's expecting an ip you just give it a little bit more uh incredible so um then after doing that and they give some examples here you exit and then reconnect via SSH, you, the prompt you get changes, and you now have a root shell. Um, you type pound, you know, bang, the, I'm sorry, not, not pound, bang, the exclamation point, and you receive a busy box root shell of, of, of AT&T U-verse routers everywhere. Wow. Um, then he goes, he adds, please note that the C shell binary was only examined briefly, not that you needed to examine it any further because that you already had everything you could want, and only until the easiest exploit was found. So they thought, nah, let's just try adding a, a, a shell command to the end of the ping's IP. Oh, well, you know, that works. Okay, we're done here. Wow. Um, so they say, Judging by the binary's repetitive use of unsafe C functions, one can guess that hundreds of additional vulnerabilities most likely exist. However, we find it highly amusing that the first vulnerability found was so trivial that it looks like it came out of one of those hacking tutorials that were so popular in the 90s. You know, I mean, it's like it, it's like from an, it's so bad. It's like from an example in a textbook of the, don't even ever think about having like not checking your parameters to see if it's actually an IP address and only an IP address that's been handed to the ping command. And these people didn't. Census, 
which is a an internet security firm, reports 14,809 IP addresses having hosts which are vulnerable. They say this is no guarantee. There's no guarantee expressed or implied in terms of th th this number will be all-inclusive. Almost 15,000 people discoverable on the internet are currently ha – have this port listening, waiting for someone, an anonymous anybody to connect, which will then allow them to take over your, your residential router with root privilege and do anything they want. And this is now in the public. Everybody knows yeah, that, you just that, gave it out. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but uh, exactly. If you're a bad Again, guy, you knew it already. You knew it already. This has already been published. And what we need to do is make sure AT and T do doesn't, you know, screw around for a few months deciding, you know, how they're going to cover their tail and and whether or not they want to fix this or not. I mean, the pressure needs to be applied. And and I agree with their position. This is not a small mistake. This is criminal negligence. I wouldn't be at all surprised if a class action suit is filed, and it ought to be. So because, it wasn't you know, Eris. It was AT&T, which mo has the rights to modify Eris firmware for these U-verse modems. Yes. And well, what, what they said at the start was because both parties are involved— uh. We and we don't know. We don't have clear attribution. So, but be, so it could have been built in, or it could have been added. But it's or not. It could have been a, both. It's not present in other Eris modems because I use an Eris modem. I think a lot of people use Eris cable modems. It's very um, that that one is present in two. When we get to number four, it's in all. <laughs> So we're so we're going in order of increasing in, in increasing pervasiveness of the problem. Okay, second problem. That was second problem. Um, called uh, case server, C A S E R V E R, which is an HTTPS server present in the NVG 599. That was one of the two. The previous one was the five nine, the five eighty nine, and the five ninety nine. This one is in the 599. They write, an HTTPS server of unknown purpose was found running on port 49955 with default credentials. The username tech, T-E-C-H, just in case anyone wants to go out <laughs> sporting around, and an empty password field uh, conferred access to this highly vulnerable web server which used only a basic authentication scheme that is nothing fancy. You just you just have to give it tech and an empty password and you're in. The server seems slightly unstable with its authorization capability, denying access on the first attempt, even with valid credentials, and eventually completely locking up with an unauthorized message. It remains unclear, they write, whether this is just poor coding or more security through obscurity, but either is unacceptable. And they write, there's a trivially exploitable command injection vulnerability here. So first, it's it's open. We know what the credentials are, and it's exploitable. The exact They say the exact intended purpose of the CA server is unclear, but its implications are not. CA server is an HTTPS server that run and I was immediately wondering. Okay, wait a minute. An HTTPS server that means it had to have a private key, and we're talking about a private key in a, in a horribly insecure modem. So that's never a good idea. But okay, maybe keeping its traffic encrypted was more important. But there's like other ways to do encryption than than over TLS. So a laziness abounds here. K server is an HTTPS server that runs on port 49955 of affected devices, which seems, they write, to only be the NVG 599 modem. CA server script takes several commands, including upload a firmware image. So, yes, anybody can replace your firmware if they like. Requests. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. That's a useful. That'd be, be, handy, for, be handy for field service, yeah, Leo. yeah. yeah. 
requ requests to a get data handler, which enumerates any object available to its internal SDB databases with a lot of fruitful information, they write, and requests to a set data command, which allows changes to that database to be made. Um, and they show a screenshot of the request, which causes a command injection. And so it's all documented here, again, as the root user. Um, and, and, and again, they note that for the first request, the server will probably reply, you are not authorized to access this page. They say this can simply be ignored and resubmitting the request shown will yield command execution. And, you know... Change this firmware. can't be Eris. This has to be yeah. some nitwit at AT&T. It's, uh, it's incredible. Yeah, you're right. It's it's too egregious. Yeah. The service can be a little quirky, they say. It locks up, as I said before, after about five requests, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I'm going to skip the rest and go to number three. Information disclosure slash hard-coded credentials. The next vulnerability involves a service also running, in this case, on 61001. 61001, which will give an attacker a plethora of useful data about the device. The attacker, however, will need to know the serial number of the device ahead of time. So not so bad. Once this information is acquired, the request can be made. On the other hand, consider that that AT&T U-verse knows the serial number of every device every customer has. And so if law enforcement or intelligence services had a valid reason they could get the serial number and persistence from AT&T uh, could use this in order to attack the device. And what's, what's well, the mixed blessing of this, uh, I'll get to in a second. So, um, so they provide the format of the command of what you do on port 61001. You have to provide this a, a weird set of hex characters, 001E46, and then a serial number in order for it to authenticate. When the correct serial number, the, the OUI is the ARIS organizationally unique number, uh, and username and password are submitted, and they document that, the server will hang for several seconds before returning a response. Afterward, several pieces of invaluable information are returned about the modem's configuration, as well as its logs. So it says, here you go. Here's everything you could ever want to know. The most sensitive piece of information are probably the Wi-Fi credentials and the MAC addresses of all internal devices in your network. And they can be used to exploit the next vulnerability. Oh, I forgot to mention, for anyone who's interested, the hard-coded username and password credentials are BDC test slash BDC test. So again, username, password, both are the same. BDC, T-E-S-T, -E lowercase. They write, this is the second most prevalent vulnerability at the moment. It is not the biggest threat. Member is needed to exploit it. If an attacker were to find a reliable way of obtaining the serial number, if present, an attacker could use the aforementioned case server to retrieve the serial number. Ah, I forgot that. Yes. So that previous vulnerability, which anyone can exploit, does return the serial number, which you're then able to leverage in for use in the second vulnerability or the third vulnerability to get the, the log dump and, and a dump of all of the useful information uh, that you might have about what's going on. Um, just incredible. Um, number four, uh, then this one, no one is going to believe. Um, the most prevalent of all. They write, the most prevalent vulnerability based solely on the high number of affected devices is the firewall bypass. That is to say, the incoming traffic NAT router bypass. We talk about NAT routers as being inherent firewalls because unsolicited traffic relate to an initial outgoing traffic that, so, it, so it's not return traffic is blocked by default. So we all have firewalls. Um, this bypasses that. 
for an, any external attacker, allowing them to access the devices in your home. They, so they write the most prevalent vulnerability based solely on the high number of affected devices. This is the firewall bypass that is made possible by the service listening on port 49152. This program takes a three-byte magic value, 2ACE01, followed by the six-byte MAC address and two-byte port of whichever device, your VCR, your webcams, your ring doorbell, you name it, whatever they want that's behind there, um, would likely would like to connect to from anywhere on the internet. What this basically means is the only thing protecting, and remember, this is the most widespread one. Apparently, they're all affected. The only thing protecting an AT&T U-verse internal network device from the internet is whether or not an attacker knows or is able to brute force the MAC address of any of its devices. However, um, the first three bytes, that is the first six characters of the 12 character MAC address, as we've often discussed, the MAC address is 48 bits. So it's 24 bits of the manufacturer and then 24 bits of a unique serial number uh, for the MAC address to make them globally unique. They are very predictable since they correspond to the manufacturer, which in this case would be Eris. Maybe AT&T changes it themselves, but probably not. Um, or maybe it's the manufacturer of the, mo the sub-modem subsystem, if that were the case. Given this, an attacker could start out with, this, with this, this scheme with the unknowns marked. And so basically, they, they show us a template for that starting up the, the 2ACE01, and then they use an XAB, I'm sorry, then, then, then they use an AB23ED, which is the known high 24 bits of the Mac, and then you have to guess the other ones. On the other hand, that's there aren't that many, but they say to make matters worse, this TCP proxy service will alert the attacker when they have found a correct MAC address by returning a different error code to signify that either the host didn't respond on the specified port or that a RST, a reset packet, a TCP reset was returned. Therefore, the attacker is able to attack the MAC address brute force and the brute force problems separately greatly decreasing the amount of key space which must be covered. So essentially what what I since the, the, this is an access method by by MAC address, it allows a remote attacker to scan for MAC the MAC addresses of the devices behind the router, essentially performing a device scan on your LAN from anywhere on the internet. And this I have to say again is present in all AT&T U-verse modems. Um, and they have some more examples of way to exploit it that they used. Um, and they get to at which point it is now feasible for a determined attacker to use a brute force attack. Aside from the brute force approach, there are other methods for obtaining the MAC addresses, such as the previously mentioned vulnerability. I mean, notice how these things even link together. Like for number three, you, you need data from number two. And now for number four, you need data from, from number three. Like, almost like this was a plan. The way these exploits, the data provided links them together. You have both plausible deniability, but it ends up being horribly frightening. So, um, so they said, aside from the brute force approach, there are other methods for obtaining the MAC address, such as the previously mentioned vulnerability, or using a wireless device in monitor mode in order to sniff the wireless client's MAC addresses. Good point. Remember that if you did promiscuous sniffing, sniffing within the area of the, of the user's Wi-Fi network, the MAC addresses are not encrypted because they're they have to be on the outside of the packets in transit for them to get from point A to point B. So anyone passively uh, uh, obtaining any network's traffic will, after a, a few minutes or half an hour, 
have eventually seen all the devices that are periodically transiting some keep alive traffic or, or beacons or pings or whatever and obtain a list of all. Now, that's, that does require you to be locally for local for a while, but as they're saying, you could also use the method from the previous exploit in order to have it dump out the log of all the devices that are talking to it right now. So they say going off of the example above, if the device's MAC address and they give it has an HTTP server running on port 80, which, you know, some device in your house, and the attacker wants to connect and issue a GET request on the, re the web route, the command will be, and they provide it, where essentially you are connecting to TCP servers running, which are normally protected by the NAT router that lets you uh, cut right through them. And they say this will open, in their example, an unauthorized TCP connection between the attacker and the, quote, protected, unquote, web server, despite the user never authorizing it. They say it is believed that the original purpose of this service, that is essentially the ability to to break through the, the, the de facto firewall and get to a device behind it, and their, and their presumption makes total sense that the original purpose of the service was to allow AT&T to connect to the AT&T issued DVR devices, which reside on the internal LAN. That would make sense because they would know what the MAC address is, and that would allow them to immediately poke right through and access a device at a known, at a known MAC address at a known location. However, they write, it should be painfully obvious by now that there is something terribly wrong. Implementation added to the severity is the fact that, <coughs> excuse me, every single AT&T service observed has had this port. I, I, I got to rewind. Added added to the severity is the fact that every single AT&T device observed has had this port. 49152 open and has responded to probes in the same way. It is also important to note that the gateway itself cannot be per connected to in this manner. So only devices behind it in, in the home, on the LAN. For example, an attacker cannot set the MAC address to that of the modem's LAN interface and the port to correspond to the web configuration console. This attempt will fail. This TCP proxy server or attackers to client devices behind. So they they wrap it up saying, in conclusion, in 2017, when artificial intelligence runs the largest advertising firm on the net on the internet, when only last year the largest leaks in American history occurred, and where vehicles are self-driving, autonomous internet connected and hacked, why do we still find CGI injections? blank default passwords with root privileged services exposed and what will most likely be termed backdoored credentials. He, he writes, developing software is no trivial ask. It's part of this company. It is part of this company's core services, but carelessness of this magnitude should come with some accountability below are some workarounds for the vulnerabilities described in this write-up. The, the time of full disclosure is gone, mostly, but let the time of accountability begin. Accountability, or is it o or is okay to continuously accept free credit monitoring for from vendors and governments and corporations who have accidentally exposed your privacy, and in this case, Maybe that of your families too. So nicely put together piece and you know documenting just a horrific situation. Um, I would hope that our listeners, this podcast's listeners, have their own NAT router behind their AT&T U-verse box. That solves most of these problems. If if you don't rely on its net routing, oh. but rather have the have, have the Aris device, just plug it in one of our little favorite forty nine dollar edge edge router X's, 
and then you're done. You're safe. Oh. There's there's still the problem of somebody getting into the into the aorist modem itself that they could do. Um, but if, if anyone is concerned, I, and I didn't keep going with this because I just wanted to cover this, but the workarounds are there. And then the good news is the outcry that this has to produce will force this to get fixed soon. But I, in the short term, I would immediately make sure you have your own your own NAT in in board of the of the ATT Uverse uh, router <laughs> unquote, and, uh, and that way at least your internal network is protected. Somebody could using that earlier, but also much less widespread. Big problem is the widespread one. So that I was like, as they said, every single device they looked at had that port uh, four nine one five two open listening, and with that that um, that proxy service running. So you want your own NAT inside. And as we know, these days, it's not difficult to do that. Well, and it's no but if you're safe. using U Uverse TV service, you may not be able to NAT it. Oh. That may be a bigger problem. I'm not sure. I do. I seem to remember that people who use Uverse have to use the router provided by AT&T. Uh, ah, uh, the in TV that case, service. maybe there's a way to run your own LAN. Your, your, Put your TV Put your LAN on separate a from your TV. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes, 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 yeah. yes. And it sounds like it's not clear. I mean, from reading the No Motion post, they do ding Eris for previously having problems like hard-coded passwords in the firmware. Uh, but it's not clear if this affects Eris modems on other than Uverse systems. I'm, I'm still not quite getting whether that's the case or not. I completely agree. We we don't know, yeah. but you know, ATT Uverse is a large footprint. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, number two or number three. I uh, but I, yeah, I would guess that most of the people who listen to this show have their own router in between them and the uh, and the and the. Moment. If not, I would then so. now. Yeah. Now you, now you do. <laughs> there's, there's never been a better lesson for why it's always good to do that anyway. Yeah. Well, I, again, once again, apologize for uh, the sound quality in this show. I think what we're going to start doing, Steve, from now on is a, is a double ender. I'll give you a week to figure out how you can record your audio at your end um, and then oh, okay. send it to us. And that would solve the problem, not for the live folks, but it would solve the problem for the podcast. Uh, Good. It, I will do that. It, and yeah. I, I should mention, I've been watching. I, I've still got that the, the trace route running, and it's actually not... A, a three hops down. That was sort of an, an initial artifact. It looks more like I don't know if there's if like there's a problem everywhere, but it looks like it's the first hop. It's it's a it's the like the other end of my cable connection is not returning. So I, I'll I'll just run through all my stuff again, and I'm and, and I'm able to do this uh, while during one of our sponsor breaks. I wrote down the IP that is the other end of this Skype connection, and I'm going to start. Poking, I, I, I'm going to probe to it, and uh, anyway, so I, it'll be fixed next week, one way or the other. I'll get it. I'll get it nailed. Okay, but uh, well, yeah. Worst case scenario, we'll do a double ender. Uh, yes, and and that way, at least the podcast uh, will, <laughs> will sound okay. And I do heartily apologize to everybody, and for all you know, for those of you missing one word in five, they'll all be in the transcript. Uh, well, maybe not. <laughs> Well, if it, if Elaine can figure it out, still. the only one that was weird, and I just want to make sure Elaine gets it right, is when you said "angel fire," it sounded like the G was missing, and that changes the meaning entirely. So I just want to make sure that Elaine understands it's "angel fire" with the G. Oh yes, I I, I I had to wait for a minute to figure out what it was. Yeah, you think meant, about but now it. You'll I know. understand. Now I, you really don't want fire there. No. <laughs> Steve is at, and the podcast too, grc.com. It's where you'll find the world's finest hard drive maintenance and recovery utility. Of course, SpinRite. If you have a hard drive, you need SpinRite. Everything else freely available, including uh, transcripts of this show and audio, 64 kilobit audio. We do audio and video at our website, twit.tv slash sn. You can get that on demand. Watch live, though, if, you, uh, if you're around Wednesday at uh, one thirty Pacific, 4.30 Eastern, 20.30 UTC. I, a lot of people watch this show live, like to like to get the latest security news hot off the presses. Uh, and if you do do that, join us in the chat room. Always a good bunch of people talking behind the scenes at irc.twit.tv. Thank you, Steve. We'll be back next Wednesday. It'll yes, be sir. my last time, and then I'm going on a couple of weeks vacation, but I'm sure that you'll have a good time with Father Robert. 
We'll do it. Yep. And I'll talk to you next week, friend. Thanks. Bye. Security now.